That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today, we're here to talk about Monday. Is it just another manic one? Uh, the fourth film directed by Argyris Papadimiatropoulos, uh, which will be uh, released April 16th, 2021, courtesy of IFC Films. Uh, originally premiered technically at the 2020 Toronto International Film Festival, uh, but only as an industry screening, which is where I saw it originally. So this is the second time I've seen it. Notably, it stars Sebastian Stan and Denise Guff. And you're familiar with one of this director's previous films? Yes, uh, Suntan from 2016, which I believe uh, uh, played at Rotterdam uh, and South by Southwest, uh, which is kind of a, a a weird little black comedy, which I actually quite liked. Okay. Um, I'm going to describe the story quickly. Okay. Okay. Monday is about a couple named... Mickey and Chloe. Mm -hmm. Mickey is played by Sebastian Stan and Chloe is played by... Denise Guff. Denise Guff. Okay. They are in Athens, Greece. They meet at a party. Mm -hmm. uh, Chloe's there having a gay old time. It appears Mickey is DJing the party. They hook up. They're drinking, drugging. They end up leaving together. And we see them wake up in the morning naked on the beach. Mm -hmm. And they're awakened by police officers and surrounded by families. So they're arrested. They're released by the nicest cop in history. Uh -huh. When uh, Chloe realizes she doesn't have her purse. She left it at the party. But Mickey offers to take her home. She can't get in because she doesn't have her purse. Don't know why they decided to go home. So he tells her, well, spend the day with me. We're going to go off to this island. He has a gig. So they spend the day together, it's lovely. He ends up making a few calls, gets her purse back. Um, and then she, they spend another day together. They kind of have a little um, conflict because he's telling her you shouldn't go. Because, okay, so they're both American. Cl uh, Mickey has lived in Greece for seven years. He's living in a friend's apartment. Argyris. Argyris. And that apartment belonged to Argyris' grandmother, who has passed. And the party that they met at is also, was that a house party of a house belonging to Argyris? Another well. house. Um, Chloe is uh, scheduled to go back to Chicago, like the, like the Monday, uh, to start a new job. So Mickey is telling her, no, you shouldn't go. And Chloe gets upset, like, who are you to tell me what's best for me, blah, blah, blah. So then they separate, you know, they part ways. We see... Mickey at his apartment with our gears. They're having like a little get together and Mickey seems down. So his friend is like, what's wrong with you? Oh, I know you're still in love. Like you fell in love with that lady you met on Friday. So he's like, well, if you love her, you have to go get her. So they ride down to the airport and in a very cliched scene, like, you know, Mickey runs, like tries to run through TSA. Chloe sees him and we fast forward to another Friday. Mm -hmm. And they're together, so she decided not to go. Mm -hmm. The film is kind of split into three parts. The first part is like them meeting. The second part is like the bulk of it is just them getting to know each other and this newfound relationship they have. Mm -hmm. And really like, it's just a series of like little incidents where we realize that Mickey is irresponsible, mm -hmm. essentially. <clears throat> and Chloe... How would you describe her? I mean, I wouldn't call her responsible, but she's definitely... They're, they're not a perfect match. No. But they're trying to make it work. Yes. They're, okay. they're kind of like, for you know... They're forcing it. Yeah. Um, Mickey has a kid, like a seven-year-old, with an ex-girlfriend. He's trying to get visitation rights. Mm -hmm. So, things sort of culminate with a wedding. Mm -hmm. One of... Chloe's friends is getting married, so Chloe and Mickey go, and that's when we're introduced to Chloe's ex, Christos. Christos. Mm -hmm. And Christos is this like rich, powerful man uh, who is very controlling and manipulative, as some other character explains. Mm -hmm. We also find out he's the one who got Chloe the job in Chicago that she ended up not going to. So they have a tense exchange. Mickey sort of gets hyped up by a friend saying, like, if you really love her, you need to show her. So he interrupts the wedding to propose to her. <laughs> that doesn't go very Stops well. Stops a, a musical performance. Yeah. yeah. Then we find out that 
Mickey has been granted visitation rights for his kid, but under the condition that he stays in this stable, committed relationship with Chloe. Who must be present uh, during Who the visitation. So now she's kind of like, again, having to be like the stalwart for mm -hmm. Mickey's life. Christmas Day comes, and there's some, the, obviously a lot of other things happen, but Christmas Day comes, and they've had sort of a stressful time, and Chloe says, let's go dancing. Mm -hmm. So they go dancing. She wants to do drugs, so they find drugs. They do them. They're high as kites. They end up getting into a little tiff, like some, over some jealousy stuff, and they get kicked out of the club. Mm -hmm. So Chloe wants to have sex, so they go to some like place, attempt to have sex, but they get caught because she's, they're kind of being loud because Chloe tells Mickey, earlier on in the film, Chloe is clearly pregnant and goes to get an abortion, mm -hmm. but she never tells Mickey. Mm -hmm. And when she tells him on Christmas night after they've been kicked out of the club and they're trying to have sex, Mickey's reaction is like, well, good. Because we were both using each other. We were just using each other, but you know, we, we, we got past that and now we're together and we love each other. And she's not... She's upset, but then it gets interrupted by them being kicked out of wherever they were. So then she has the bright idea, like, let's go to the beach and have sex again, but let's ride to the beach naked. So they're high, naked, on a moped riding. They get pulled over by police, arrested. During that process, Chloe assaults an officer. So it's Friday. They get thrown in jail, and the constable or whomever is like, oh, well, you're not going to get out till the judge sees you on Monday. But uh, they panic because their first visitation with Mickey's son is that weekend. So if they miss it, for sure, it's mm -hmm. going to be a problem. We see her spend the weekend in jail. She gets out with the help of the nicest public defender in history. She goes home and uh, Mickey's there in a nice little sweater. And he says, oh, I got out because I called your ex and asked for help. I had to do it. I can't lose my kid. I asked him to get you out, but clearly he couldn't do it. So she's very upset. And there are several moments in the film where it's like, okay, things are coming to a head. There's conflict. It seems like she realizes I shouldn't be with this person. I need to move on with my life. And this is that moment at the end of the film where I thought for sure she's going to break up. Nope. The next scene is them picking up his son from school. The end. Okay, that was long, sorry. <sighs> the sentiment between these two people was very much, you had me at YOLO. <laughs> yeah, really. They found love in the club. Um, okay, I did not want to watch this movie, but you were interested in reviewing it, so I agreed. Well, um, I also wanted to read, because I've seen it before, and, yeah. I wanted to, and I did not have a good impression of it, and... Did you think I would like it? Uh, no, but I, I wanted you to validate my feelings. <laughs> oh, I'm happy to do that. Um, okay, I only know Sebastian Stan from the series Political Animals with Sigourney Weaver. Mm -hmm. I know that we reviewed a movie called Endings, Beginnings. Endings, and Beginnings. You yeah. had to tell me he stars. Mm -hmm. I did we, not remember. We also that. reviewed The Devil All the Time, which he's in. He's the oh. law enforcement officer. I didn't, I wouldn't remember. Oh, I kind of remember that. Mm -hmm. His profile reminds me of uh, Jamie Dornan. Who was his competition right. in Endings, Beginnings. He, that, that chunky, blocky hair they're giving him in this, and I don't know if it's because I've been watching a bunch of Burt Lancaster films I haven't, I neglected to see. He has this Burt Lancaster choppy block thing going on. That's the on. least of his problems in this movie. Okay, I really did not care for it. Should we want to talk about anything you liked first? Okay, one of my top... Oh, the only thing I wrote down that I liked was the music. Okay, yes. I liked the music in the film. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexis Grapsis was the composer, but the musical selections as well. And I, Well, I, the only I, song I recognized was Donna Summer's... I was going to say Donna Summer's bookends kind of two different points in their relationship, but I Feel Love is like a top ten all time. And sure. maybe my own personal fantasies jettison me away from where I would rather be than watching the film again. But... Um, I also think Denise Guff is a very striking looking person and I must, I kind of wanted to say I really liked how she looked whenever she wasn't wearing makeup. I thought she, well you helped me with this, but I thought she looked like if you mix Lori Petty she did. with Ellen, with Troy Sivan. Uh, yes, those <laughs> were all references I thought of as well. But I, I think in my mind's eye, I don't know, if she'll always remind me of um, Karen Knightley's Paramore in Colette. Um, 
which I thought she was excellent in. But to me, I think I was still conjuring images of her from that film and this. And I think, I, I just really wish they had styled her differently because the style has a lot to do with their, dare I say, character development. I'm just going to go down my notes. I think they seem old. They seem too old to be up to these shenanigans, <clears throat> particularly Chloe, the actor who plays Chloe. I thought she seemed a little elderly. And I know people don't like that, but I'm going to say it because I'm going to get to another character calls her grandma too. So I feel like I, it's okay that this character seems more mature, except in the story like notes or, you know, the description of this film, it says that they're in their mid thirties. I just think that she's miscast in the way that they played her. They could have made her like an early 40s lady who met this beautiful young Greek man and it, fell head over heels and decided to abandon her life in the U.S. to stay in Greece. That would have made sense. Well, very. It's, that's very Roman Spring and Mrs. Stone by Tennessee Williams. Well, but. you know, I'd rather be derivative and tolerable than this, but they were too old to be in this club. Sure, but, you know, to be fair, just Sebastian Sands is only nominally younger than her. Um, I, I, I also thought he looked too old. I, I know for him it's a plot point for his character that he's immature and irresponsible. So the fact that he looks like he's in his late 30s and still acting like he's in college, it makes sense. But I think for her, because she's also styled, like you mentioned, her hair looks, it's interesting. And then she's dressed very, it, it just didn't fit for me at all. I think there's, there's just too much that's not really off, both with character development and the plotting and the relationship that I think makes this seem jagged and on a lot of different fronts. Um, like her being a lawyer, but not really behaving as that. And I don't really understand what has, besides this relationship that didn't end well with Christos, what has jarred her into not, you know, being mature and responsible anymore. But she's the least lawyer-like character I've seen that's supposed to be lawyer since Jodie Turner Smith and Queen and Slim. It's like, there are too many actions. It's like, I need... Well, the ending, her behavior, yeah. I mean, she does not... <laughs> she does a lot of things that just don't make sense for someone who's an attorney. Because... Yeah, that's and who's the, saying she's, like, the more responsible mm -hmm. one. She, early on, tells us that her job in Greece, and she's been there, is to help people get to... Immigration, to, yeah, law. In, into the, uh, uh, America. But then... When she's talking to the public defender at the end, she's just like, what's going to happen now? Like, she seems so... Right. Yeah, she seems lost in how, like, the judicial system works. <laughs> right. Um, and, and then there's another scene that, that doesn't work for me, too, is when she obviously has made the, the decision to live with him, but this has not communicated that there's a very, maybe triggering for us based on a past experience, uh, situation with a couch that she doesn't tell him about. We'll get to that, because I think it's worth noting, like... In relation to this film, it feels very long. It's nearly two hours. It just feels like it's bloated and there are scenes like the couch scene, like a few others that didn't belong. But I wanted to mention the cop when they first get arrested. Mm -hmm. Because the story feels very light. Like everything works out for Mickey. Mm -hmm. He's always like one phone call away from getting what he needs. He's arrested right away in the beginning of the film and the cop is like, immediately these two walk in. And he's like, oh, uncuff them, uncuff them. And I didn't know if, like, the cop recognized Mickey. But it didn't seem like it because he doesn't address him. And then, he, like, or just because they're, like, good old white people that... I mean, I don't know. I don't know why the, the, the cop immediately said uncuff them. And then he goes, do you like football? Like, who's your favorite team? And then Chloe answers with, like, a team. And then he's like, oh, no, I prefer whatever and then he makes some greek reference that made no sense to me well it makes no sense that she also didn't have any idea on her and they're still like fine just go um the amount of sex okay the connection these two kids they have no chemistry as far as i could tell certainly not enough to say like oh let me abandon my life that i was about to go to in 12 hours to come stay in greece and live with your dumb ass and the only thing that seems to bind them together is sex. There's a lot of sex. Mm -hmm. But not filmed in a way that suggests that, that they're uh, obsessed or have a compulsion. For Literally them. nothing about their sex that, that they're having seems appealing or um, intoxicating. Right. There yeah. needs to be, that dick needed to be triple A, USDA grade. Like for her to just throw her life away to stay there with someone who she doesn't know because there's nothing else he can offer her. Right. Right. And, and there are so many sequences that it ends up just feeling like a repetitive mess. 
i.e. like a, a terrible toxic relationship, sure. But as for a viewing experience, I'm fine with unlikable characters, but this, the sacrilege here is that no one's interesting. I don't care what right. happens to any of them. Uh, there's no empathy. The scene with the abortion uh, and, and then the revelation of the abortion, there, there's no empathy or poignancy there. Um, you had commented that the story feels like maybe there was a component, like a percentage of improv that was kind of slapped together. And that would make sense to me because I have several lines that felt very, like, basic. Like, when... Our, what's his friend's name? Argyris, who is uh, Yorgos per Perpasopoulos, who is in a really good Athena uh, Rachel Singari film called Chevalier. Like, when he sees them together for the first time, he's like, you guys have been fucking. It's written all over your face. And then when, when he confronts him about being in love with her, he literally says, are you in love with this girl? Fuck you. Like, just very basic. That scene I, mean, I also had a problem with because they're in his, Argyris' apartment that uh, Sebastian Sam lives in, and there's all these people. Right. And he's shouting over these people. They go into, like, the kitchenette area, and Sebastian Stan says, who are these people? He's like, you know these people. These are our friends. Like what? It, to me, it's, it seems like they were given notes about what needs to transpire in the scene, and then the actors worked it out for maybe some organic um, chemistry and feeling. And it, it instead it feels very forced, which is surprising because uh, Papa Demi Octopus uh, wrote this alongside Rob Hayes, who wrote Chewing Gum and uh, Gretel and Hansel. Oh, both things I enjoy. Yeah. So uh, another scene is when <sighs> the moving. That was a very problematic sort of story point is for me because she just, Chloe has an apartment in mm -hmm. Athens as well and she's going to move into uh, Mickey's. So the morning of, they're supposed to move. It, seem, it appears that they haven't talked about it at all except that she said secure a van. And of course, Mickey didn't do it because he's irresponsible. And then he explains to her, oh, well, there are only like two vans in the city. Like, I'm not going to be able to rent a van. Okay, don't know why you didn't say that in the beginning. Then he makes a call, and he's like, oh, I got it. They go to a place, and the guy is, like, giving them the van, and he wants money for a deposit. And mm -hmm. they're like, well, you said it would be free. And I just think the carefree nature of how this character operates is excessive. And also that she doesn't Unrealistic. tell him what needs to be put in the van. Then she doesn't tell him what needs to be put in the van. So they finally get in the van. They make a pit stop because there's traffic and have more boring sex. They get to her apartment and she has what I think is a very reasonable amount of stuff. Yeah. It's just like, you know, maybe like 12 medium sized boxes and then a big ass couch. And she's stuck on this couch because she says she spent a lot of money on it. And it's the only thing she's ever bought that had any value. Mm -hmm. Which is hard to believe that someone who graduated law school and passed the bar and practices law... Like, this couch is the thing you're holding on to? And if something's that important to you, you make sure that it's taken care of and the right... Number one. Number two, if you're that stuck on that couch, it just seems like, oh, but you were really about to move to... But she's seen the stairwell at Sebastian Stan. I just... Again, it seems like a little thing that if the story would... If these characters would have worked better for me, <laughs> and this kind of thing wouldn't bother me, but it's like just another, like, stupid thing for these two characters to get fussy about, and then they don't actually have a real fight. The way they resolve it is uh, Mickey agrees to move the shit, they get to his place, they attempt to move the couch upstairs, and they can't. So he says, well, you got to get rid of it. So instead of just, like, doing what an adult would do and call someone to come get it or sell it... He decides to have a party, like a block party, mm -hmm. which disturbs the neighbors, and like DJ with loud music, and bring like an ex-girlfriend to mm -hmm. help DJ, which we'll get into, and then he lights this damn thing on fire. Mm -hmm. It's just like, we get it. He makes poor choices, he's irresponsible. It, it just is too much. Mm -hmm. It is too mm -hmm. much. Um, and I get the, the sense that it's supposed to be about this consuming love where you forget all the details of life and reality. Right. Sure. But then this... Because this scenario is the stuff of film noir. This should have felt like Bonnie and Clyde. This should have felt like Gun Crazy. Like these two are are insatiable for one another. Drunk in love. And I and I don't get that at all. No. Um, then right after the couch. So the couch burning scene also introduces the idea that Mickey was part of like a successful band. Like they make it sound. The, I thought the scene where they're talking about the band was really corny. The dialogue was corny, but it sounds like they had a successful band mm -hmm. that had a successful album and toured. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, he decided to go solo. And the other member of the band, whose name is Bastion, this black lady, she decided to go solo, and now she's very popular mm -hmm. with a very successful album. 
So that was kind of like, okay. But then he calls her like the day of and she just shows up mm -hmm. to help like DJ this couch burning party, which was so stupid. Then they're talking about it. And that's when it's the three of them, Bastion, Mickey, Chloe. Chloe's tired from a long day of doing stupid shit, falls asleep. And then that's when Mickey and Chloe or Bastion and Mickey are like, okay, great. She's asleep. Let's go. And they go start doing drugs. And Bastion calls Chloe grandma. And I thought, okay, so now these characters are these characters are even more unlikable because Mickey, his behavior with Bastion I thought was inappropriate for someone who does have feelings for Chloe. So now here's one more thing that just makes him like, he's kind of gross. Who cares? She's stupid. Who cares about her? He he feels so undefined that I found myself not even really thinking about Mickey uh, all that much. Then Bastion tells him, is it true you're only happy when you're a failure? Oh, God, yeah. And it's just like, There's so again, we get it. That, <laughs> again, that felt that scene in particular with Dominique Tipper playing Bastion felt so clunky uh, that they had to get these ideas, these the psychology of the characters across, but it, it just doesn't play well. And there, again, I'm, repeat, I'm being repetitive now too, but uh, th this film, there's just so many repetitive details that should have been more efficiently laid out because this at two hours, at, at the 90-minute mark, it's exhausting. And I'm, I have so many notes I'm exhausted about how much I didn't like this movie. <laughs> but there's a scene that goes on way too long where he's been hired to write a jingle. That was my next note. Um, hated that scene. And, and it's um, intersecting how they're, now that they're both living together and they're both working from home. So she has this client and that's where we're first introduced really about this toxic relationship with Christos because she tells this client she can't have him when she finds out that that's where the referral came from. But then we get an actual scene with Christos where he's being creepy at the re wedding right. reception. We we don't... We did not need that scene and it's, oh my God. And then the client with the jingle was annoying. It just grating. Um, the party scene I hated. That too. was my next note. So there again, the symbolism is so heavy handed. So Mickey and Chloe throw a party. So it's Chloe's friends who are all sort of like hoity toity. And then Mickey's friends who are all like just, I don't know, burnouts who just want to drink beer. Who are rude and, uh, and even before, adolescent. Even before the party, they get a scene where Chloe comes home from, uh, she had to go do some visitation stuff with the ex. And she tells Mickey, did you make the food? And he's like, oh, no, but I have a plan. And then he orders a ton of takeout, which she has to pay for. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, at that moment, it should have been like, I'm so pissed, we're over. Nope, they have the party. The party goes terrible. Like, the guests hate each other from opposing sides. It's uncomfortable to watch and not funny at all. Then when it's over, Chloe's like, well, that couldn't have gone worse. Mm -hmm. And then but, they have but sex. kind of funny about it, yeah. Like, okay, so you both are just... <laughs> Whatever. Um, I will say I like how some of the nightclubs, especially in that second nightclub scene where everything goes to shit, I, I liked how that looked, how um, it was shot. But you had kind of other problems with the look of the film. So getting, what I think is funny is the jingle that uh, Mickey's writing for this client is, it's not made clear what the jingle's for and the client is just this obnoxious character who's being picky, but it sounds like they need something for like Greek tourism. So the client keeps saying like, it needs to sound more authentic, but not, but like contemporary, just being stupid. So there's this battle between like these two sides of like what, what, what tells the story of like what Greece is. But then we get this movie shot in Greece and I feel like it doesn't represent Greece well at all. When I think about Greece, I think about like beautiful beaches, white sands, beautiful architecture, bright, sunny, beautiful people. And then this film, at the bare minimum, the first half when they're like drunk in love, well, we don't see that, but apparently they're drunk in love. I feel like the film should have been bright and showed the beauty of Greece. And then when things start to devolve, then it could look like how this film looks. Any other, there scene, any other city. Any yeah. other city. Because this film literally, like, I feel like there were parts where it could have been anywhere. Well, yeah, there's a part where she's, like, walking where they're trimming trees. Yeah, that could have been Brooklyn, uh, yeah. Guadalajara. The beaches were, are very tight shots. So it's like, that could have been a pool. I don't know. Then, oh, God. It's just so many things. When Chloe meets uh, Mickey's ex... To talk about the kid. Oh, yes. And then it's more exposition about how he is. And it's like, we just spent over an hour. We've already been told. We his, already know. His actions with, uh, with what uh, Chloe's asked him to do and always failing. We get it. We get it. 
the end of the film on Christmas Day when they go out, before they go out, they, they're at home and they had a little tiff, but then they start drinking, so... They sing a song. She Because he also hasn't bothered to learn... Greece. Greek. Greek, sorry. <laughs> uh, to speak with his son, the son's native language. Uh, so she's showing him... She's doing all this heavy lifting by teaching him through song, through his own language, uh, to, speak, to speak Greek. Uh, and that scene goes on way too long. Goes on way too long. And they've been drinking. Like, we see them drink multiple drinks. Then they get to the club and immediately order six shots of tequila. Then they order, like more cocktails it's just like and i wanted to say i don't mind kind of the age how whether they look older than they are or the age that they're supposed to be um there are people of the in this age bracket that act like that that are trying to reclaim this i, I just wish again there are too many other things off about how the presentation that m makes it uh, nonsensical sure um the public defender helping Chloe, I don't understand why that lady was so nice. Oh yeah, she brought her. Uh, she brought her an outfit and told her she can keep her little Ann Taylor loft uh, pantsuit set. Uh -huh. Like I just don't understand why that's happening. Um, I don't know. I, I this video is getting long and I, I don't want to keep talking about it. Like I feel bad that I don't like this movie. I don't feel bad that I don't. <laughs> I, uh, I I feel justified because my first reaction to it, which is why I didn't review it on a tip, was like. Am I missing something? Because um, it, it has a lot of elements that if they had worked together, I think could have made a really decent film. Um, and, and also Greek cinema overall, because I, I think Papa Dimitropoulos kind of is adjacent to the Greek weird wave that, you know, was basically from 2009 to 2013-14. Um, even though he was working in those years, Suntan felt very much like post-Greek weird wave contemporary Greek cinema. And this feels... Like something out of left field. Um, what would you give this film? Uh, one out of five. I would give it one out of five as well. Thank you. Bye.